Shall I pick one? Okay. I'll admit people, yeah? Hello, everybody. Can you guys hear us well? Yes. Nice. Max has changed his name. Very nice. <laughs> we have another Sarah. We have a lot of Sarahs today. It's possible if people, uh, if you signed in using my Zoom link, uh, yeah. I posted on LinkedIn, feel free to update your name yeah. <laughs> to be more yeah. reflective of, uh, uh, of your identity. Great yeah. to see everyone. Great to see everyone. Yeah, we have another Simon as well. Nice. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll suggest uh, let's wait maybe uh, one or two more minutes to give people some time to, to join before we start. the main conversation but it's really cool to have you guys already here in the meantime it'd be great for everyone to put in the chat where are you all calling in from so we get a sense of of where the crowd is today terrific Seen a good amount of German representation, some US as well. Boston, who's in Boston? Let's hang out. Vancouver, Canada. This is terrific. All right. Nice. I'll suggest let's wait until three passed and then uh, we'll we'll move on. because we also obviously don't want to waste your time. Happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for joining. We'll begin momentarily. Yes. And I mentioned this a couple seconds ago, but some people have joined since. If you joined from the LinkedIn link that I had posted, um, feel free to update your name as well. All right, I'm handing All right, it to you. Cool. Yeah, it's three past. We have around 60 people, a few, uh, hopefully uh, a lot more will be joining. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for, for being here. It's really, it's really amazing to see you all. Um, maybe two points um, before we start. So the first point is maybe some of you have already seen it. We're recording the session uh, to be able also to learn uh, ourselves. Um, so if anybody feels uneasy or uncomfortable about it, uh, just let us know in the chat. Um, And if not, then it's amazing. The second point is after this um, event or after this call, we'll send you all an email. And this email will include a link to a short survey, a very short survey. Uh, just takes one minute to fill it out. It would be great if you guys could fill it out because um, there's two points to it why you should fill it out. The first point is what's in it for you. Um, one for the world has uh, committed that they will and donate money per person that will fill out the questionnaire and donate money themselves. So you can basically increase your impact by just filling out a survey very easy um, and very time effective, just one minute. And the second point is that it helps us to uh, track the success of this event uh, and it helps us to learn for the next event next year. All right, so after those two points, um, let me just mention a few people that will talk today. So just to give you a broad overview. So I'm Simon, I'm, uh, um, I co-lead the EA group at BCG. I'm a consultant there as well uh, in one of the German offices. And uh, I'll also be hosting one of the breakout rooms, um, the German one later. And then the next person is probably Sarah. Uh, thank you for being here, Sarah. Sarah is a uh, former strategy consultant, and uh, now she is the head of the EACM, the Effective Action Consulting Network. She's the managing director. It's really amazing to have her. She makes, she does amazing work. Um, so if anybody 
has any questions about the EACN or herself, feel free to reach out to her. You'll also see the email um, from of her uh, in the in the follow-up email. If anybody of you does not know what the EACN is, the EACN is a um, community of consultants who try to do the most good possible based on um, reason and evidence. And we have around 600 plus members currently, uh, and it's growing uh, and it's really amazing. So basically just consultants trying to have most impact possible and around the giving season around December, um, the biggest impact that we can have is uh, by donating money to effective causes. And that's why we're all here. And that's why we're really excited to have you guys here. Two more people. Um, Anne, she is a, a former BCG project leader, also from a German office, and she is the managing director currently at Effective Spenden, which is the main effective giving platform in Germany and also Switzerland. Uh, she will also be hosting uh, the German breakout room. So if you have any questions, um, you can ask her later. And then um, we have Jack. Jack is uh, the CEO of One for the World, um, which is basically a building movement for effective givers. And he'll do the main presentation today. So with, before I hand it over to Jack, um, what will happen today? The first part is the presentation by Jack. He will talk about effective giving, um, how you can um, increase your impact with your donations, uh, and he'll also take your questions. And then the second part is uh, we'll have breakout rooms uh, where it's uh, where you have more space or more yeah, opportunities to ask your questions or the questions that you have. We'll have one breakout room for the German speakers. We'll have one breakout room for the English speakers. All right. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to slot those questions in the chat um, and we'll track them and uh, then we'll answer them later. And now, uh, without further ado, Jack, uh, take it ahead. Thanks very much, Simon. Welcome, everybody. As Simon said, my name's Jack Lewis. I'm the Executive Director at One for the World. Uh, I have never worked for a consultancy, but I did fail the situational judgment tests at PwC in 2011. So in that respect, I have some relationship to consulting. So I'm just gonna lay out a very simple case for effective giving. We think this just makes common sense. Um, and some of you may have heard parts of this before, but we're just gonna try and layer it so that you get the general context of why we think giving effectively is a huge opportunity and how we think you can take advantage of that um, as consultants. And the first question of course is, well, why should we give at all? And the best answer I've heard to this uh, comes from the bioethicist Peter Singer, and it's called the uh, drowning child analogy. And it goes like this. Imagine that we're walking through a park and in the center of the park, there's a pond. And in the center of the pond, there's a child struggling to stay above the water. And we look around and there's no one else there. It's just us and the child. Would we jump in and try to save that child from drowning or would we walk on past? Well, obviously we would jump in and try and save the child. Not only would that be an unbelievable opportunity, that might be the best thing we ever do in our lives, but we'd also reckon that there's a bit of obligation there because if we just strolled on past and then met up with a friend of ours and said, oh, the weirdest thing happened, I was in this park and I saw a child drowning, but you know, I just carried on past, then obviously our friend would have a lot of questions about our judgment in that situation. So it's an opportunity, but also there's a little bit of obligation there. Now imagine that the reason we're going through the park in the first place is that we're on our way to a really important meeting at work and we've got notes for a presentation in our pocket and our phone in our other pocket and our laptop in our bag. And if we jump in and try and save the child, we're gonna ruin those items and we're gonna to have to pay to replace them. Would we still jump in and try and save the child? Well, yeah, of course we would. We would recognize that the value of the life of the child far exceeds the cost of replacing a phone or a laptop or even the clothes that we're wearing. Now imagine that instead of being able to see this child and jump in and help them directly, we just know that they exist. So they're not right in front of us. We can't jump into the pond and pull them out, but we know that they're out there and they're in exactly the same situation. They're just struggling to stay above the water. We could help. And if we don't, they're gonna die unnecessarily. And now imagine that instead of jumping in and trying to pull them out, we're just told, well, you could donate the cost of your phone or your clothes or your laptop, and the result will be exactly the same. Would we take that opportunity exactly as we were prepared to jump in and ruin those items and bear the cost of replacing them without thinking twice? Well, the answer is actually, we seem to see it in a different way the minute it becomes abstract. And that partly tells us something about the way we think about morality, which is when we have concrete things right in front of us, it gives us a degree of moral clarity. But it's also important for us to recognize that 
we're actually in this position all the time. So we don't think we are. We don't think that we're walking through a park and uh, about to see a child. And if we ever did that, we'd get the urgency of the situation because it's right in front of us. But actually, of course, we're in this position every day. And that's because, unfortunately, the pond doesn't represent a pond. It represents extreme poverty. Now, extreme poverty is defined as living on less than $1.90 of resources per day. And that's adjusted for purchasing power. So that's not, I think those of us in high income countries think, oh, well, maybe $1.90 goes a bit further somewhere else than it does here. No, that's literally the equivalent of living on $1.90 in the US or in the UK or in Europe. And of course, we immediately think, well, that's just completely impossible. I mean, it's preposterous. The idea that I could live on $1.90 is, is utterly ridiculous. I've probably already spent many multiples of that just today on you know, a takeaway coffee and a bagel this morning. Well, yeah, it is impossible. And that's why extreme poverty is a killer. It kills around 14,500 children under the age of five every day. And that's because when you live in extreme poverty, you're faced by this escalating series of impossible choices. So do you um, feed your kids or send them to school? Do you get treated for a persistent uh, health problem that you have, or do you repair the leak in your roof that gave you the health problem in the first place? Do you buy fertilizer so you can produce a bit more food and sell some to get some money tomorrow, or do you put food on the table today? And when you're faced by these impossible choices where there is simply no good option and you're constantly having to choose, eventually you just run out of luck. And that's why extreme poverty kills nearly 14,500 children under the age of five every day. Now, this is a really hard statistic for us to get our head around because it's so massive and it's so incredibly morally awful that uh, there's actually a name for this. It's called scope insensitivity. We just can't scale the amount of empathy that we would feel in the case of the individual child in the pond to take account of this huge number. So how can we put it in perspective? Well, there's a really bleak way of doing this. Imagine a plane and imagine that on the plane in every seat, there is a child under the age of five. And now imagine that that plane crashes and everybody on board is killed. Well, if that happened every single hour, every day, all year, that would kill about five and a half million children a year or about 14 and a half thousand a day. Now, obviously, if that happened even once, there would be a huge reaction to it. We would ground planes, we'd have congressional hearings, we wouldn't let another plane take off until we worked out how this had happened and how we could make sure it never happened again. But unfortunately, it's happening all the time. It's just not newsworthy because it's something that's been going on for a long time. It's not immediate. There are lots of biases in the way that we consume news that mean it doesn't come to us. But of course, we're in the same moral position. It's exactly the same as the child in the pond. Just like in that situation where just because we can't jump in and help them directly, we can still bear the same cost, which is replacing our shoes or our phone and have the same moral outcome, which is preventing the death. Well we have exactly the same moral cost as the plane crash right now. It's just happening in a way where we don't process it. Now, this is a really bleak thing to wrestle with. In fact, the longer I work in this area, um, the harder I find it to get my head around the fact that we live in a world where this is true. But there is good news here, which is we believe we can prevent every one of these deaths and we can do that by giving effectively. And extreme poverty is just one cause area where we can do this. So we can also look at things like farmed animal welfare. There are about 80 billion animals farmed in unimaginably cruel conditions. And we can do something about that and have an effect at a massive scale. There are also risks to um, all of humanity, things like uh, pandemics, nuclear accident, where we can actually make a difference to the chances of these things happening. I mean, you, we've just seen um, the effects of a pandemic, and it might shock you to know that we spend more on ice cream every year than we do on trying to prevent the next pandemic. So we have these amazing opportunities um, where we can make a massive difference, often with relatively small investments. Now, One for the World tries to uh, raise awareness, both of people living in extreme poverty, but also of the opportunities to give effectively. But why do we need to do that in the first place? Why do we have to educate people about giving? Well, these statistics might surprise you. Only one in three donors does any research at all on charitable gifts. And you might think that you would never do that because you're more sophisticated than that. But I do that. I literally work in effective giving. But earlier this year, I went to six weddings and almost all of them said, don't give us a wedding present, give to this charity. And I gave over the money. And I don't know what those charities are called and I don't know what they do. It just seemed like the right thing to do. So two thirds of us will just give money without doing any research at all. And then of those who do research, two thirds are just trying to validate a choice they've already made. 
Now, by contrast, only 3% of donors do comparative research between different nonprofits and then give on the basis of that research, which is completely wild because we just don't treat any other economic decision in our lives like this. I'm in New York at the moment for work, uh, which means I spent five minutes this morning finding the best coffee shop in the area. Obviously, it was run by someone from Australia uh, to get a good coffee in the morning. But also I had to book a flight and I had to book a hotel. And I used an entire industry of comparison sites to try and find the best value for that. And I definitely wouldn't do something like getting a mortgage or buying a, a, a health insurance policy without doing a lot of research. And yet, when it comes to charitable giving, we're not prepared to do this due diligence at all less due diligence than we would do on buying a coffee in the morning. Now, why is that? Well, one reason is really positive, which is most of us have very high levels of trust in the charitable sector, and that's good. We want to keep that because I've worked in the charitable sector for 12 years. Most people in the industry are trying to do uh, a, 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 a important work on very difficult problems without enough resources, and they're very earnest about trying to do that. So it's good that we trust that they will do their best with the resources we give them. But we think another reason is if you say to people, how effective do you think the most cost effective charity in the world is compared to the average, they'll say, oh, it's probably about one and a half to two and a half times better. Now, I'm told that people can only ever remember three things from a presentation. And if that's true, I want you to remember this one from this presentation. The best nonprofits in the world are demonstrably 100 to 1000 times more cost effective than the average. And if we had that knowledge in the front of our minds, I think we would think more about where we give to charity. Because the truth is, you probably can't give 100 or 1,000 times more to charity than you do right now. Assuming you give at least 1% of your income, you definitely can't give 1,000 times more to charity than you are right now. But you can have 100 to 1,000 times more impact if you choose the best, most rigorously evaluated, most efficient charities in the world. So at some point, we've got to work out what these nonprofits are. And to that end, I have a quiz. I would like you to think, I'm not going to invite you to put it in the chat because there are more than 100 of you on this call, but I would like you to think which of these programs you would support if you had 1,000 US dollars and you were trying to produce the most years of healthy life uh, as an outcome from the program. Um, so you can do... Uh, Program A, providing piped water and flushing toilets. Program B, giving people chlorine that will disinfect their drinking water. Or um, uh, program C, giving children who are ill zinc and electrolyte salts or oral rehydration salts, as these are often called. So which of these would you, would you support? Think in your head, would it be A, B or C? And if you're interested, the research we're drawing on here is called the Disease Control Priorities Project. And I'll just post a link to it in the chat, a big meta-analysis of uh, health interventions in low-income countries. So <clears throat> on every one of these slides, a heart equals a counterfactual year of healthy life. And what that means is if we had two groups of people who resemble each other in terms of you know, geography and economic conditions and education and everything else, uh, pre-existing health conditions, and we give one group the treatment and one group doesn't get it, we see this much difference between the two groups. So if you went for piped water and flushing toilets, I have two bits of good news. The first one is, you're gonna get six months of healthy life from this program counterfactually. So it does work. The evidence shows us that it does actually have an effect. And the second one is this is really cost-effective because in most high-income countries, we'll spend about 75 to $150,000 on a treatment that gets us an extra year of healthy life. So getting one for an extra year at $2,000 pro rata is really good. But the bad news is you did choose the least cost-effective program because uh, household chlorination is about 10 times more effective and zinc and oral rehydration salts is about 33 years of extra healthy life for $1,000. Now, why is this? Well, basically because piped water and flushing toilets infrastructure is expensive and needs a lot of hooking up and it needs sewage plants and water treatment plants to be effective. And so with your $1,000, you can only take credit for a fraction of the project. But when it comes to zinc and rehydration salts, you can buy thousands of those treatments for $1,000. And so you're able to help people uh, at very large scale. And also you'll know if you've ever used oral rehydration salts, they're very effective at stopping you being hung over and dehydrated, uh, hung over. That is such a Freudian slip. They are very effective at stopping you being hungover. They're also very effective at stopping you being dehydrated. Hangovers very rarely kill people. Uh, being dehydrated tragically does kill hundreds of thousands of people, uh, often because of things like diarrhea. So we have this massive problem that we can treat in this very reliable, very cheap way. But of course, I've limited your choices here to a particular area of programs. So what happens if we think about any disease in a low-income country? 
Well, the World, Bank, the World Bank's best guess is that $1,000 spent treating and preventing malaria produces 200 years of counterfactual healthy life. And so what did we say earlier? We said that the difference in effectiveness was 100 to 1,000 X um, if we choose the most cost-effective programs. Well, this is it, because uh, we could get six months of healthy life for our $1,000, or we could get 200 years. And this is the opportunity that's in front of us every day. So if you find this convincing, what is the approach to giving we're using? Well, it's highly data driven. We let the numbers guide us. So we look for um, organizations that are transparent, where we have evidence that what they do actually works, that they can show their impact and that they're lean and efficient in the way that they deliver it. Um, now, there is a whole other approach to giving, which is much more common, which is something where we have a personal connection to it. And we're not saying that this is a bad idea. Actually, we celebrate giving in all its forms, but we're saying we know that not enough people are doing truly cost-effective giving. And when you look at the amounts given to charity, we should be doing a better job with the amount we give to charity overall. You know, in the US last year, about $470 billion was given to charity. And we could have made a much bigger uh, difference if we'd focused more on what the data tells us. And so we're looking for things where we have big, tractable and neglected problems. That is problems that are large in scale, where we can actually make progress on them and they don't have enough funding right now. And that leads us to things like global health and poverty, to animal welfare and to these risks to humanity, where we think there are outstanding donation opportunities. And that in turn leads us to nonprofits like the ones on the screen. So the Against Malaria Foundation can purchase an insecticide treated bed net. If you sleep under it, you're much less likely to get malaria. And they do that for about five dollars. And we know if you distribute roughly a thousand nets, roughly one person who would have got sick and died won't uh, because of the net that they're now sleeping under. And so you can save a life for about five thousand dollars. You've also got places like the Humane League who do uh, an excellent amount of advocacy research and, and, and influencing um, to move people towards um, plant-based diets and also to reduce the suffering of, of farmed animals. And the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, um, which looks in a very holistic way at things like pandemic preparedness and how we deal with bio risks. So these are the sorts of organizations we uncover when we do an exhaustive amount of research with professional full-time charity evaluators. And these are where we think you can make the most difference as an individual donor. Now, if you find these options compelling, maybe because you didn't have a strong opinion about where to donate, or maybe because you find these numbers surprising or persuasive, you've got to ask yourself, well, how much should I give and how often? And we like to use a tool called the How Rich Am I um, calculator. You can go to this right now. Someone can post the link in the chat because it's really important for us to realize how uh, lucky we are when we live in high income countries and how much of an opportunity we have. So if you have a household income equivalent to $80,000, you are in the richest 1% of the whole uh, global population by wealth and you're earning about 28 times the median income. Now, if you were to donate 10% of that income, you would still be extremely fortunate and be in the top richest 1% of the global population and you'd still be earning 25 times the global median. But at the same time, every year, you could fund 1,600 bed nets, nearly 8,500 treatments for schistosomiasis, which is a parasitic worm disease. And approximately every year, two and a half people who would otherwise have got sick and died won't because of something that you, that you funded. And this is just an unbelievable opportunity. So we really need to think, what is the difference in our quality of life if we earn 72,000 rather than 80,000? And how does that compare to the opportunity every two years to uh, have helped avert roughly five deaths? And so we recommend giving regularly and consistently and in proportion to your income. We know from the data that giving regularly makes you a more effective philanthropist. It helps the charities you're donating to plan and scale appropriately. And ultimately, you'll actually end up giving more because you won't be affected by short term incentives or worries. And you'll just give an amount that you know you can budget for and that you can afford. And so our, our ask of you today is to start a regular effective donation. And if you do this, you are going to join a movement of people who are a giving in proportion to what they're able to give and try to recognize the privilege we have living in high income countries and how we can use this to have a staggering difference in the world. Make it, It's an unbelievable opportunity. But you'll also be joining a group of people who are prepared to say, with at least some of my giving, my personal connection to a nonprofit is not as important as trying to do the most good that I can with the limited resources I have. So we hope you will take that opportunity uh, to join us. And then we're gonna provide you with some links to do that um, at the end of the presentation. 
So at this point, I, I, I've seen some questions in the chat that I'll deal with. Um, and if you have any other questions, do put them in there and, and, and I'll try to answer them for the next um, five minutes. So uh, scroll back up. So maybe the first question that's uh, from Michaela. Um, Michaela, do you want to raise your question in the, in the call? Sure. You know, interested to see the impact of electrolytes. think that makes sense, but also feels like that's not a systemic change. That's sort of a responsive change. And so curious how you think about giving in near term kind of symptomatic ways versus giving towards structural improvement. Yeah, great point. So we definitely need both, right? We don't want to live in a world where in 50 years we're still giving out electrolyte salts and zinc uh, rather than building infrastructure. But we need to think about where our point of leverage is as an individual donor. And as an individual donor, we can have an enormous amount of, of impact by trying to help ameliorate some of these symptoms where you're looking to big multilaterals or government to build you know, countrywide infrastructure. And I often think about this in the context of what we've just seen with COVID. Obviously, it's important to come up with systemic solutions where we can, but that doesn't mean that we should stop dealing with the acute symptoms. And the example of this is, we knew that what was ultimately gonna help us with COVID was vaccines. But that didn't mean that we refused to invest in ICUs or personal protective equipment or any of the other things we could do in the short term and just say, well, we'd better wait for the vaccine. And so, yes, we do want to see more infrastructure and systemic change. But right now, children under five are dying every day for no reason. And I think we need to recognize that gives us an unbelievable opportunity to act right now. Maybe another question. Um, it might be worth elaborating on it. Sarah's already shared a link. Thanks for that. What are donation effectiveness figures based on? And uh, do you do your own research on it? Yeah, I mean, there's One for the World is not a research organization. We leverage research from very well respected charity evaluators, professional charity evaluators. Broadly speaking, you look at the um, likely harm if something happens, you look at the incidence of it, and you look at how much it costs all in to prevent it. So unfortunately, charitable marketing is extremely dishonest and you've probably seen lots of things saying, oh, you can do this for 10 bucks, you can do this for five bucks. Most of those figures are not true. But when we say five bucks buys a bed net, that means it buys it, treats it, ships it, gives it to someone, teaches them how to use it, and we monitor it afterwards. So it's the all in cost, including overheads. And basically, if you know what the likely harm is, and you know what the inputs cost and, and how reliable that chain is. So, you know, some bed nets will be misused. Not everyone will go to someone who is going to get sick. You can come out at a cost per, per outcome. Um, <clears throat> and, and then, you know, the same is kind of applied in other, it's basically an expected value calculation. So you look at, well, what do you have to put in? What's the chances of it having a big impact? And, and where does that leave you in terms of expected value? Um, when you look at big problems like pandemic preparedness, obviously your chances of actually preventing a pandemic are much lower, but the benefit is much higher. And so you can still end up with a pretty good expected value from that sort of work. Thanks. We have another question by Mfunno, in case I, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Um, has this question already been answered by the answer to Michaela's question, or is this question still Okay. So, so I'll just read the question. I, I think there is something to pick up here. So it says, how do you think about balancing the percentage of your donations going to systemically altering developing economies like funding education versus alleviating specific problems? Um, I think you've kind of illustrated what I was saying earlier, which is um, it's hard to think of somewhere where as an individual donor, you could have a systemic effect on an education system. I mean, it's possible, but I, it's just hard to think what that might be. And then the other thing that might surprise you is that one of the biggest, if not the biggest influence on educational outcomes is how sick or otherwise children are. So it doesn't matter how good your education system is if you have malaria or a parasitic worm disease and you can't go to school. And so actually, in, even in studies that focus on educational attainment, what we often see is that treating pervasive debilitating health conditions is actually a better way. And that does lead to macroeconomic development. So. I'm not totally confident in this estimate, but I have seen a figure that every dollar spent preventing malaria adds $12 onto the GDP of that country uh, because of extra education and econ economic productivity and, and so on and so forth. Maybe two questions that keep coming up. The first question is, uh, first question is uh, will slides be shared? Um, yes, not those exact same slides will be shared, but different slides that will give you a different, different a summary of what we've talked about, because those slides will also um, um, include 
different links that will help you to donate tax deductible based on the country where you are. So for example, Germany is effective spending. Then for example, the US or Australia, you could use one for the world. And then there'll, there'll be a slide with all those links that you can use directly. Um, and this also answers the second question that keeps coming up. Um, what are the different charity evaluators? We already have one uh, in the chat. Sarah, thanks for that. Or I don't know who posted it. Uh, it's um, give well. But then um, in this slide deck that we will send you, um, there will be more charity evaluators that you can use. But give well is certainly a very good one, uh, a very central one uh, that you can start with. <laughs> yep. I was going to say, before we go into breakout rooms, Yolanda, do you want to voice your comment? Maybe we have Jack respond and then we'll let's dive into breakout rooms if that sounds good to folks. Um, I was just looking at what Mufundo said, and I was wondering, um, in addition to mun municipalities and governments um, coming up with structural changes, I'm looking at how are they supported so that those, those solutions are sustainable, because um, I remember going to Ghana in the 90s, and a lot of uh, financial support and stuff people would come in and do stuff, but then they didn't give them the means, the technology, the equipment and the training to continue. I mean, it'd be something like a road only went so far, the grant ended, and then the every every length of the road beyond that was just still dirt. It, it, it was very odd. So um, we don't wanna see things where they're recreating the wheel. I wrote shell by accident. But instead, kind of leveraging the best practices that have worked across time and that have worked across diverse populations. Because so often I see with nonprofits, it's like multiple nonprofits trying to do the same thing, no collaboration across the lines, huge gaps and, and borders around the service and the mission they think they say they have. Um, and then and over time, nothing really changes nothing really changes. So, I mean, this isn't a presentation for that, but that is um, one of the things I see with um, giving and uh, nonprofits at, at best. Yeah, thank you for that, Yolanda. Maybe it's helpful, Jack, if you can just touch on that misconception about aid being ineffective generally, because I think that might be something a lot of folks here think. Yeah, I mean, you've raised a lot of important issues, and I think um, my wife actually works in the a sector, so I've seen a lot of this firsthand. It has really evolved in response to a lot of these criticisms, and I think a lot of the things that were really terrible about the way we did aid 30 years ago are somewhat better now, um, and a lot of the most acute criticisms, I think, are a bit outdated. Um, <clears throat> There are a couple of things I would say. One is, you are right that the patchwork of coverage is very uh, mixed and a lot of different orgs are different effectiveness. One thing we would hope to see is people consolidate around the most effective things. So in most markets, capital goes to the people who perform the best. That is not true in the charitable sector. There's no real correlation between how much money a charity gets and how well it performs. It's much more to do with marketing. So that would be one thing that would really help. And then the other thing is, all of our non recommended nonprofits are pretty deeply embedded with government. You know, some of them work specifically on policy. You think about the Johns Hopkins Center of Pandemic Preparedness against Malaria Foundation, 50% of every bed net has to be funded by local government. And so we are seeing improvements in government capacity and the real integration of local voices into the way it's delivered. And I'd have much less confidence in them if they just, I mean, this is facetious, but if they just, you know, bought and FedExed a bed net to somebody, you know, this is actually an organization that's working very closely with local delivery partners. Uh, but yes, I, I, you know, I take your points about um, we need to build capacity and, and be more consistent in the way uh, we try to solve these problems. All right, cool. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, as Sarah suggested, let's dive into the breakout rooms. Just before we dive in, just remember, you'll uh, you'll get a follow-up mail with us uh, from us with all the main information and also the the, the, the survey that um, it would be amazing if you could fill it out. Right, so I'll um, open up two um, breakout rooms. One is English, the other one is German, and you can pick um, which one you want to go to. And then those from those breakout rooms, we will end the event, so we will not return to the main room again. You may, like I did, have to click a menu that says more in order to see the breakout rooms. Um, so if nothing's flashing up on your screen, look for the three dots called more.
Thanks, Jack. Hi, everyone. So um, <clears throat> what we thought we'd do in these breakout rooms is just um, ask people to share some of their stories with effective giving. We'd like Sarah to start that process off and particularly to talk about how um, her career in consultancy led into the work that she's doing now. Um, so Sarah, I'm just going to hand over to you and then hopefully we'll have time for a bit of discussion and to hear some other stories from the audience. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks so much, Jack. And really excited to see all these familiar new faces here. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Sarah Pomerantz. I'm a strategy consultant at Accenture, and I'm the managing director of the Effective Altruism Consulting Network. Um, so I just want to share my own uh, get, uh, effective giving story with you all, um, and then learn more about all of your thoughts on, on the matter. Um, so for me personally, I'm a, I'm a planner and I'm an optimizer to my core, as I think many consultants are. Um, I optimize my investments for financial independence, my schedule for productivity. And so it's kind of a no brainer to me that I was going to optimize the impact of my donations, um, whose purpose is to do the most good possible. But the problem for me was that I wasn't really sure where my money could go to do the most good possible. I've been pretty skeptical generally that any one of us can have an impact in a world where we face such large challenges like climate change, political division, wealth inequality. So in my quest to find the answer to this big fundamental question, I picked up Peter Singer's book, The Life You Can Save. Um, prior to then, I'd assumed that at most, there must only be like a one or two magnitude difference between the world's best and worst charities in terms of how much good they did. Um, so to me, donations were merely kind of a matter of personal preference. What charities do you like? What do your friends donate to? What does your church tell you to donate to? And that was kind of it. But through reading the book, I was presented with some of the numbers and ideas that Jack shared with us earlier. And my mind was blown on three counts. One, the fact that some of these nonprofits are that much more effective than others, like a hundred times more effective. Two, the fact that there were people who were thinking full-time really hard about how impact could be quantified and compared across causes and nonprofits. And three, I came to just realize the real implications of believing that all lives are uh, equal and have equal moral value. Um, and if you take this idea really seriously, which I personally do, and are then presented with the facts that some orgs are able to help way more um, for the same dollar amount, it just becomes painfully simple, at least to me, that those are the organizations that my money should go to in order to do the most good. Um, so with that realization in hand, I sat down, I created a giving plan. Um, every year I donate 10% of my income pre-tax charity and much of it to highly effective charities um, through organizations like One for the World. And I donate on an automated monthly schedule um, because I think it's important that the nonprofits have visibility into their revenue streams. As someone who's like running a nonprofit at the moment, I sure appreciate when I know um, how much money I'm going to have for the course of the year. And so people telling me that they have a monthly donation really does make a huge difference versus just a one-off donation. Um, and I honestly view my donations as an investment in the positive impact that I'm having in the world. Because to me, knowing that I have an extra 10K in the bank just doesn't make me nearly as happy as knowing that the funds that I'm donating are used to treat malaria, restore eye vision, and in practice, save two people's lives every year. Um, so in so many ways, I've just come to realize that consultants are exceptionally well positioned to make a positive impact. Uh, when you combine the fact that we're in the richest 1% globally, which I'm pretty confident that most of the people in this room are, um, and number two, that there are organizations like GiveWell, like One for the World, like Effective Spending, who have done the research to measure nonprofits' impact and validate their effectiveness. Um, for me personally, go giving and donating wasn't enough, and I kind of became addicted to this idea of doing the most good possible with the resources that I had. Um, I've also began to have the sneaking suspicion that my time and skills as a consultant could be even more valuable than the um, you know, 11K I was donating annually, um, which is why I'm currently on a leave of absence from Accenture strategy. And I'm trying to test out this hypothesis through running the Effective Altruism Consulting Network and spending my days thinking full time about how I can do the most good possible. Um, and then just trying to do it without having to pay attention to my firm's bottom line or sales targets. 
Um, and I find it quite liberating. Um, so if you do have the same sneaking suspicion, um, then I definitely encourage you to reach out to me uh, personally, and I would love to chat and speak to you more. Um, but even now that I work full time as a managing director of the EA Consulting Network, I still value my donations as an important impact diversification tool. Um, and just as a tangible way that I can know that even if my day to day focuses on supporting folks like yourselves, thinking through how they can do the most good with their careers, at the end of the month, my donations are going to directly address extreme poverty, malaria, and other global health blights. Um, and my donations are my anchor to my, my commitment to do the most good. So um, yeah, I just wanted to share my, my story with you all, especially coming from a consultant to consultant perspective of how I've thought about these things. Um, and I still also donate to um, other organizations as well, um, as I know Jack mentioned doing. So it's, it's not all or nothing, but I really, really encourage you to not just log off today um, and go back to that slide deck you were working on or that presentation but to like take seriously the ideas we discussed, share them with others, talk about them, um, and really consider making the commitment 1% of your charity, of your donations total going to effective organizations can make a real tangible difference. Um, but yeah, eager to hear from everyone here as to your own thoughts and, and any questions or stories people want to share. I'm happy to share. Um, Sarah, thank you for sharing that. It's very inspiring to see someone just go all in on this. I'm... Um, newer to EA and been exposed to some of the ideas over the last year or so and really came at it initially from the career perspective, the 80,000 hour perspective, but recently been thinking more about just, I think the key idea to understand for me was how much more your dollars can go in different charities like we were talking about today and just how much more a dollar goes outside of, you know, Canada or United States and what you can do with that is, is truly incredible the same way you might be able to fly somewhere else and have a way cooler vacation because of currency differences you can also make a big, way bigger impact as well um, recently we've been working with PwC to bring some of the effective charities in I've actually been working with Federico who's on this call right now and that's been a great process um, and then for myself, also just getting a better understanding of what these charities are, specifically what give well, the top four charities that they're recommending. And I know there's a couple other organizations that do some of that research too. So it's been a great educational process for me. I really like the idea of the recurring charity, um, recurring giving, Sarah. So that's something I'm going to bring into um, my own as well. Even if it's the same total amount, if you chunk it up, it's going to be better for the charity than... Um, than at one time. So yeah, overall, very much inspired by this group. And also um, I'm gonna be bringing more and more focus and bringing this more into my workplace as well going forward. That's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing, Rod. Great to see you too. I know Yolanda, you have your hand raised. Would love to hear from you. Oh, thank you, Sarah. I really inspiring story that you have. It makes all kind of sense. My dendrites were popping listening to you because <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, it's good to have an echo a ripple back to you of stuff that you've been thinking and feeling and practicing. So that's good um, because I've been sharing with lots of folks about, you know, donate the way you pay for your streaming service. You pay that every month. And so uh, groups you have an affinity for just set it up for the, every month they get a drip. You know, I, I have a content writing business and for um, Giving Tuesday, I'm promoting that I promoted the five organizations I consistently give to just trying to show that people like it's just that easy. It's just uh -huh. that easy. And I came today because I want one of the organizations, they don't have enough money to have to pay have one paid staff person. And I'm like, I need to be in the seat so I can learn what the community of thinkers and loving people in this room have to say about this. So maybe I could take a um, a little nugget back. Um, I had one question. I don't know if someone in the, in the, in the space can answer, but uh, often I see um, income disparities in major metropolitan areas, especially the ones that it seem like all sexy and fun and everybody wants to live there. Um, but I wonder, have you ever seen a US city that employs some sort of giving requirement by for-profit corporate entities. Um, Cause I have this, um, which I don't think is a utopian idea, but I, I have this um, 
idea that, you know, you go into cities and they give corporations these uh, tax abatements for multiple years. And then they say they're going to give, they're going to hire this many people and so on and so forth. All of it end up being a, t uh, a, a, a tall tale. Um, but I figured if, if these corporations came in and the, the municipality says you have to give this much to health, housing, and ex and education, or we're not going to have it. We're not going to get in bed with you. We're not going to deal with you. You go to another town. Yeah, yeah. Have um, you ever seen anything where a municipality has had that kind of requirement? Yeah. So great, great question, great point, and glad, glad definitely that you're encouraging also and eager to get people to donate regularly and interested to hear Jack's perspective on this. Um, I've seen in terms of like lottery specifically and in an international context, I've seen countries that require um, lottery organizations to invest back locally um, based off of the profits, like a margin of their profits gets invested locally. Um, I think the question I ask myself as an individual donor is right, like if if I think that people's lives here in the States and in Boston, where I live personally, are just as important uh, as people's lives who live in a small village in Ghana um, or in Nicaragua, like that at the end of the day, if those dollar amounts are the same and, and a lot more good can be done in those other places, um, I, I feel like that's how I kind of have to reconcile with where my donations should go. Um, and I think it's a challenge also for corporations globally, a lot of uh, the consulting firms we focus on or we talk to and all that we work at often are donating pretty locally within where the office is. Um, but I think it'd be really great if if more corporate citizenship team, more CNC, CSR initiatives um, had that global lens of like how, just like we want to do the most good and have the best results and the most impact for our clients, how can we take that perspective of wanting to do the most good possible with our donations? Because often these, our consulting firms are donating, you know, millions annually. How do we get those money, that money uh, into the places where it'll best be used? Um, so that's, that's kind of something I think about. Uh, but Jack would be keen to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I haven't heard of this specifically. One thing that springs to mind is the global minimum corporation tax is going to make this easier because you, uh, especially as work becomes less geographically centered and we embrace a lot more distributed work and so on, companies could just choose not to work in certain places if they, you know, if they have the opportunity to go somewhere cheaper. So that might help. Um, and then there's a kind of whole secondary problem, which is, to what extent can local government or any government really deploy resources effectively? And there are obviously examples on both sides. There are examples of enormous important change executed by governments, and then there are examples of poor spending decisions or uh, politically motivated spending that might not be addressing the right problems in the right way and so on. Um, so yeah, uh, it's an interesting proposal. Yeah, and I did put a, a link in the chat um, to the giving multiplier for folks who are maybe on the fence about whether you want to start thinking about donating globally and viewing things um, from this effectiveness mindset and are still pretty used to just donating to those charities that um, you grew up on or that you have a close personal affinity to, Giving Multiplier will match your donations um, to effective causes. So um, that could be a good transitionary tool as well. Um, I see a lot of other familiar faces. Or do people have questions or are eager to share their own giving stories? Because we'd love to hear them. Um, well, look, guys, we're we're close to time. Um, I just want to finish with uh, two things that I want to emphasize to you. The first one is uh, giving for almost all of you will be tax deductible. So if you give ten dollars, it's only going to cost you seven. So just think about that opportunity for a start. And secondly, I think this is something that every person with disposable income in a high income country can do. And I really would challenge you, the table stakes for me of trying to be impactful in your life are giving at least 1% of your income to highly cost-effective nonprofits. So if that's you already, great, be ambitious, think about giving more. If that's not you yet, I really, really, really would encourage you to do this. And your material quality of life will not change if you give away 1% of your income. You will live the same life, you'll just be doing more good.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Zach. And uh, or Jack, what am I saying? <laughs> Thanks so much, Jack. Um, and thank you all for covering out time on your busy Fridays to engage with these ideas. Hope the conversation doesn't end here. Um, please feel free to reach out to Jack or myself to keep having these conversations um, and take the ideas forward with you tonight through the weekend, share yeah. them with others. Um, yeah, but thank you all heartfully and hope everyone has a great holiday season as well and an altruistic one at that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cheers. Take care.